recording Thank started you. but we don't see the full screen we see the powerpoint click on you haven't yeah here we go very good well good morning everybody um the topic today uh, for me representing rutgers university and uh, the east coast previous uh, research and development projects with ethnic specialty crops. Uh, I'm entitling mine Multicultural Crops, Research and Development, some aspects of production and some aspects of marketing in this brief time that we have together. Uh, on behalf not only of Rutgers University, we have had many partners and cooperators, primarily from uh, the University of Florida and the University of Massachusetts so that we have sort of three different growth zones, the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast. Our two program leaders are Ramu Govindasamy and James Simon, who uh, cannot be with us today, but I'm substituting for them. And I am a, a statewide extension worker for Rutgers University. It's a land grant institution. And we work through the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. We have three research farms of 300 acres each in North Jersey, Central Jersey, and South Jersey, as well as several smaller 50 to 100 acre farms uh, around our campus that we use for research. Uh, basically, uh, here's the brief overview of some of the topics we will be visiting today. Um, we went through our team and our partners, but um, I think the lesson we have found in the last two decades is start with marketing first. Don't start growing stuff. It's helpful for getting a grant, getting support and avoiding uh, errors in what crops you choose. Like for the last hundred years, our growers in New Jersey, especially, they grow five crops. They gamble on new crops all the time specialty niche markets. One loses money, three of them might make a little money, and one is a, a super earner. So that's sort of the way things are going. We're trying to aim with more knowledge and more extension outreach, how to minimize those failures from fertility and marketing uh, and uh, improve uh, the profitability in some of the crops that are selected in the, in the future. So, uh, our projects used a market niche, uh, marketing first uh, approach, which uh, I had seen from industry, actually. I worked 20 years with BASF uh, in agricultural research. But when I got to Rutgers, uh, Ramu Govindasamy, our ag economist, was right on the same page. So we had uh, several months of discussion with our small, market, a small research R&D group, and we hammered out what type of information we needed from uh, consumers. We wanted to know what the market demand was out there. And we focused on the two largest growing groups. There was a lot of uh, ethnic groups out there, but mainly a couple of Asian groups and a couple of Hispanic groups. We were focusing on vegetables, leafy greens, and herbs. Uh, then we'll go to some examples of our equipment on the farm, our methods, and how we evaluated things and then led to extension outreach. Uh, we have information sheets to market locally. We're interested, we have smaller farms in New Jersey. You know, uh, we only have 10,000 farms in New Jersey. New Jersey is about the size of a county in Texas. So uh, we're, we're pretty packed there. Uh, so consider us the uh, uh, Golden Garden State where we, uh, really grow a lot of specialty crops on small acreage from five to 50 acres for local consumption. Uh, or it gets sent out to Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, DC. Um, and we've got some good feedback. So uh, if I have time, I'll get into some other ways to produce rather than in the field, uh, using a greenhouse, uh, geoponics, aeroponics, hydroponics, which is really the growing way because we have a shorter season. Basically, uh, in the north, we only have 120 good growing days. In the south, we have 200 good growing days. But in Florida and Texas, you, you're almost year-round production. So we got to look at high tunnels and greenhouses, and then we'll lead into the group discussion later. Uh, here's a brief glimpse of our team. 
uh, Albert Ayani, our professor, horticulturalist uh, from Nigeria, has been very helpful for African Caribbean crops. Uh, Gene McAvoy, the extension agent and, pre and current head, uh, president of the NACAA, the, the National Ag Agents Association, uh, which David's well aware of. Uh, Frank Mangan uh, out in Massachusetts. Uh, this is our New Jersey farm in uh, Snyder. Uh, Pittstown, New Jersey. Here's Ramu. So, uh, and here's a list of several other people. Uh, we were fortunate to get an award for our uh, 10 years or more of research. We had two grants, both over a million dollars. And especially helpful was in getting those grants was having a market first orientation. Don't start just growing varieties and doing trials and fertility work find out what your market demand is. And as we can see with the population growing, the market demand is really, really growing. Uh, uh, this, these guys have helped us, Dr. Jim Simon, distinguished professor, and Ramugavid Sami, head of uh, ag economics. Uh, you know, 74 refereed journal publications, 14 extension publication, peer reviewed abstracts, book chapters, presentations, trade journals. So uh, getting that, with a, a nice uh, touch uh, for our specific work that we're trying to share. And the main thing we're trying to share is focus on uh, the specialty market. It's hard to get information here. And already I've seen uh, from the previous speakers, they're really getting right on that. And uh, so target your market type and talk to the consumers, interview these consumers, get their demographics, get their consumer crop pres, uh, preferences, what they want to eat, what they're cooking at home. And then you can calculate how much demand is out there, whether it's locally, statewide, or region-wide. Uh, where are these market sites? Where are you going to sell? Uh, there's certainly a, a big difference. If you go to one market, you might just get people that want potatoes and sweet corn. You go to an Asian market or an Indian market or a, a Mexican market, it'll be very, very different. Uh, and it's even different when we compared uh, Mexican markets to Puerto Rican markets. Uh, some of our farmers went big into hot peppers because, hey, the guys over there speak a lot of Spanish. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go. And they kept trying for a couple of years to sell hot peppers in this Spanish speaking market. But lo and behold, the Spanish speaking people were Puerto Rican and their food preference is more European. They don't like hot peppers. They like mild peppers. So that was a big mistake that you can learn in advance if you can get the demographics. And Rutgers has generated GPS demographics to show you each individual county, uh, what ethnic groups are there and where the markets are. And then from there, you can estimate how much to grow and what your demand is. So. Uh, Focus on, we're not gonna focus on specialty crop production for the first year until we know what we're doing and can give our grow. We're trying to avoid the growers making the mistake. And so far we've been pretty successful. Our particular study, because they were the most numerous population were the Asian and Hispanic groups. We, we broke the Asian group into uh, Chinese, which include uh, Taiwanese and uh, other Asian groups, but and Asian Indians is a separate group. And Hispanics between Mexican and Puerto Rican, of course, are pretty distinct differences. That's how we developed our food crop demand in a consumer survey with focus group meetings. We had bilingual interviewers interviewing in the first grant 1,000 ethnic speaking uh, first generation immigrants. What were they eating? Uh, for vegetables. And then a few years later, we did the same thing for leafy greens and herbs. And uh, that telemarketing firm was very helpful. After we developed the questions we wanted them to ask, $25,000. These are the states that we covered from Maine, 16 states down the coast to Florida. When you add up all the people here, Chinese, Indian, Mexican, Puerto Rican, you get about 6 million, and this is a little older data, trending probably to 7 million, and soon it's gonna be eight, nine, and 10 million bellies to feed, first time immigrants, and 
the more their restaurants and markets uh, appear in these states, we find some of these crops are going mainstream. How much are these crops worth? Uh, getting information uh, from the different market vendors, we saw that the Indian crops had a high level in this particular year of uh, 230,000, of 230 million on the East Coast per year. And uh, for the Asian, Indian, uh, Chinese, uh, 295 million. So that's about a half a billion dollars. Uh, and that's going up and up and up. What crops are they consuming and spending on? They didn't spend too much on perilla or Malabar spinach or basil. They spent a lot on oriental eggplant, oriental spinach, pak choy and baby pak choy. That's where the real money's being spent and gained. So that's the food dollar year after. We're dealing with food crops here. They're an important element of everybody's diet. They need to be nutritious and uh, relatively inexpensive. Uh, and you can make a lot of money because these groups, these crops really yield quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the Indians had different uh, tastes, not similarly, differently <laughs> uh, from their uh, mustard leaves and bottle gourd to fenugreek leaves, eggplants and bitter gourd. That seems to be a big topic of discussion. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's where a lot of bitter gourds go. Uh, and with the eggplant, um, we see both groups like eggplant and coming from a European Italian background, uh, I thought I knew everything about eggplants. It's just black magic eggplant. And lo and behold, I've had too much eggplant Parmesan over the years. And when I started 15 years ago, comparing all these different uh, international eggplants, I realized they're better. They taste better, they're thinner skinned, and they're better for you because in the skin is the essential nutrient, the nutrition. And that is really good for you. Italians just cut that peels off and throw it away. It's a little too hard. And especially that, Purple Bride is just beautiful. It glistens, it's sweet, and it's a winner. So there's uh, several uh, varieties of eggplant you might want to try. Uh, as we look in the households for ethnic greens, not just vegetables now and herbs, uh, the Chinese category, Shanghai bok choy, Chinese broccoli, spinach, they, these households consistently buy that every week. Um, for the households for greens, this is a whole different, this was our second uh, 1,000 person interview. Lyceum elite, I had never heard of that, but that's what we learned by uh, interview. Sugar pea tops, I have well, so it might be worth it to pick off those tops. Garland chrysanthemum, Shanghai bok choy, uh, and the list goes down the line. With the Asian Indians, turmeric, we really can't grow that here in the North. And that is definitely a crop that might be considered in Texas and Florida. Amaranth is something- Dr. Scarappa. Yes. Uh, sorry, real quick. As you're going through these slides, uh, I see that you're using consumer surveys, but just wanna make sure that, that I understand, were these prices also measured against volume? Because it could also be that, you know, you're talking about eggplants and the varieties, that's a very sensitive commodity. So it tends to, to have a higher price per pound versus something like, I don't know, a radish leaf or, or eat, let's say, um, you know, fennel, uh, not fennel leaf, fennel Greek. Um, you know, fennel Greek weighs almost nothing. So it could be that there's more volume of that moving through. And so the price per pound is less. So I just wanted to know, did you look at the, the, the poundage or the price or, or the frequency for certain items as well as the cost that we're willing to spend? Yes. Uh we got okay. about a 250 page document on that, that I don't have time to go into detail and I'm not really qualified <laughs> to it. Dr. Ramu Govindasamy. Yeah, Maybe. yeah. And uh, I think if you talk to Ramu, he can give you those off the top of his head. Uh, and I can send you that uh, Rima data if you would like. Um, excellent, thank you. Excellent question. 
the volume versus the uh, cost. Uh, and then we can bore in just into New Jersey, moving away from the coast. Uh, and you can see from these uh, shaded graphs, we're not a melting pot in New Jersey. We're more like a, a mixed salad bowl. There's a little cucumber here, a little iceberg lettuce there, a little romaine there, a little olive there. And these concentrations show up, as you can see in these graphs with African-Americans, Asians, Hispanics, Native Americans, and, and Caucasians. This, um, it, it's just an a, a important thing to know. Know your local markets. But nonetheless, when you add it all up, the diversity in New Jersey is the third highest after California and New York. And um, I'll show you something even more specific in our county that surrounds Rutgers University in, in central Jersey. The Caucasian population is 42%. The Asian population is 25%, about halfway divided between Chinese categories and uh, Indian categories. In fact, the Indian population is really growing. Actually, my, my students, like, I would say at, at, it's probably 25% uh, Chinese and 25% Indian often in some of these classes. And similarly, we have a growing Hispanic uh, Latino population. Uh, not all counties are like that, but uh, man, the number of Indians in just one town is 55,000. It's like, and they're right around, all around us. So they send their kids to Rutgers. Now they gave us all this information on what crops they like to eat and what ones are hard to get, one, which ones are available. Uh, so we got a hundred crops and we use this funnel system to make an educated logical selection. Uh, there was 42 that made sense. Uh, and then when it came to New Jersey, we had to decide there's only 28 of those 42 prime ones that we could really grow. Those are the 14 I'd recommend that uh, Texas and Florida look to because you have longer growing seasons and, and also a similar uh, ethnic group. Uh, so, uh, and then eventually we'd wind up with the, the top 10 and some of them were the same that we tested for a couple of years in Florida, a couple of years in Massachusetts and three sites in New Jersey. Here's like some summary of our top 10 and within that growing them for several years uh, that we could grow in New Jersey. You got to look at it differently uh, in each state. Each, our growth zone in New Jersey ranges from like a four and five in the north, a six and seven in the central portion, and an eight and nine in the south. Even though we're small, we have three different growth zones, simply, basically. And uh, consider your growing degree days and soil types, et cetera. And in our situation, we had to decide on Indian sorrel, radish greens, the greens, not the radish. And amaranth was a, a, a big one there, uh, green amaranth in particular. Uh, in the Chinese category, uh, Shanghai bok choy, baby bok choy, uh, chives, and flowers. The Mexican group, Purslane, they're in jar in Purslane. I used to work in the fields with Mexican guys and I couldn't believe that we were trying to kill the Purslane <laughs> between the rows. And these guys are putting bags and bags of them. You eat that? And so, I, I, yeah, I, I started eating. It was uh, pretty nice because my grandfather, we'd like go around the fields and get sorrel from lawns and dandelions. Uh, so it, it was a good taste. And uh, also top in our area, chard and papalo. Uh, Puerto Ricans have a totally different diet needs, and they go a lot of leafy greens, lettuces, dandelions, more, you know, oregano. So we've started them off. These slides will be available through Joe at some point in his recording. That's what these look like to give you a visual picture. Uh, Jim Simon is the expert in basils. He's developed three different varieties that are sold today. And uh, he, he especially likes uh, Thai basils. Um, I like edamame. I've grown that quite a bit. Lufa, 
I use that to scratch my back. It's a good sponge. <laughs> I don't eat it. Um, and the ones that are in yellow, baby bok choy are, are some of the more promising ones. Perilla, bok choy, oriental mustard for our Asian vegetables. When it comes to Asian greens, it's a whole different bag. Chinese broccoli, chives, spinach, and again, green amaranth. That's what they look like. And I'm sure a lot of you are pretty familiar with some of these if you've been through an ethnic market, also in the big box stores nowadays. Moving over to the Asian Indian group, they like this tricolored amaranth quite a bit. They always demand that one. Uh, mint leaves, uh, not just for mojito, but for several other culinary dishes. Uh, mustard leaves. And there's their Indian eggplant. Asian Indian greens and herbs. As we mentioned, fenugreek, purslane, again, radish tops, the greens, uh, Malabar spinach. We can't grow uh, this turmeric and, and other spicy things, but uh, they're trying in the greenhouse, actually. Move on over to Mexico. Uh, these guys are definitely into peppers, all kinds of uh, more mild type from the Anaheim pepper. Uh, chili poblano to the moderately hot type from the chili serrano and jalapeno to the super hot habanero. And I'll talk more about that later. But mostly I, I like the tomatillo. When I tested about five different varieties, I really love the Cisneros years back. It's the biggest one. It's the closest to a tomato. And uh, that one won out and growers started growing it. And the only problem is harvesting. It's a little sticky. But uh, the price of tomatillos in our local markets and Wegmans and ShopRite is more than tomatoes. I mean, we're a big tomato producing uh, vegetable uh, state in the garden state, but the uh, price of tomatillos is higher and more profitable. And they grow very similarly. Mexican greens, amaranth, chard, again, purslane, Lema Verdina and Roselle. A lot of the groups like Roselle for various reasons, uh, whether to drink as a tea or as a leafy green in a salad. Uh, and we're looking at several different concoctions of that. Okay, that's basically a quick eyeball view of the crops. Let's start planting. Uh, this is the, the fun part. So, uh, steel in the field, we uh, get a good seed bed and uh, take out a lot of the winter annuals that are there because it'll cause a lot of problems and rototill it up. Then we uh, get our tractors out and plant some uh, uh, plastic culture with trickle irrigation, uh, generally 32 inches across the mounds from uh, four to eight inches, depending on the site. Generally we have sandy loam fields. Uh, some are more clay loam. Uh, we come out of the greenhouse with our transplants and uh, we have replicated plots in every event. And uh, in this case, we're planting uh, amaranth. Uh, we are trying to rebrand it as, it doesn't have a good name because many of you know, it's also known as pigweed in our way. And we spend a lot of time trying to kill pigweed. And the farmers don't like that. So we like to call it tropical spinach or summer spinach because it fits a market niche when the cool season spinach fades out. Right in the middle there, this stuff grows like wildfire. So uh, Jim Simon collected 97 different variety cultivars from around the world. And in replicated plots, they're being put in staggered rows. And fortunately, we have a lot of student labor to help out. Because uh, they're all plant science people and horticulture people and entrepreneurial business people. Here's our man, Jim Simon. He'd rather be out in the field. I'll tell you, this guy is a master transplanter. I don't know how he keeps it straight in his head, <laughs> along with his assistant, uh, Trevor. 97 replicated different plots. Uh, and this is the machine that he goes down the field with, and he's been doing that for years. He's got an amazing knack, and he loves it. He's always puts a smile on his face. Um, these are what our transplants look like from the 
greenhouse nearby. We grow our own and we, we don't really direct seed much of anything. We mostly don't even field grow stuff. We use plastic culture, plastic culture, plastic culture. There's too many weeds and we don't want to use that much for, uh, herbicide. Once the things are growing for a month, it's amazing. From those little transplants, this is less than a month later. Amaranth, tropical spinach, grows amazingly fast. It's tropical. And I can't imagine what it's going to be doing in Florida and has been doing in Texas. But there's so many colors and so many sizes. Uh, previously, we had like 500 acres in Pennsylvania for flower for, and bird seed. Uh, but now looking at it uh, as a leafy green is a whole nother story, uh, not only to reach the ethnic crop market, but possibly go mainstream with this. So these guys evaluate it according to height, uh, yield that we're going to get at the end, color, and most importantly, taste. This was our taste panel, and I was involved doing that. And some of these don't taste that well to me. <laughs> I wouldn't put it in the salad. I'm a well, I don't, I don't like kale that much either. I like baby kale, but once it gets big, just like baby kale, this gets a little bitter. So you want to get it early. Uh, and some of them, it doesn't matter how soon you pick it. Some are very tasty. And that's what we're trying to determine here. And those 97, which are our top five or 10. Uh, this was one of the ones that particularly tasted good and, and kept a low stature. Um, and some of them bolted very quickly. And, and we don't want that either because when they bolt, uh, the taste gets very bitter pretty quick. So th these are some of the plots and you can see how diverse uh, the phenotypes are of these. And so we're trying to, uh, these guys are breeders. Jim will look for the best ones and maybe uh, crossbreed some or just try to propagate the best ones because there are, even within the same seed batch, there's a lot, some diversity. Uh, and one good thing is to begin marketing why it's still out in the field. In this case, I invited uh, my friend, Laura Erickson. She runs three farmer markets uh, and community gardens. And uh, so she was amazed to see these in the field because, before she gets them and she's very happy. Oh, she was a farmer actually in New England and she is familiar with some ethnic crops. Uh, similarly, my... Uh, colleague, my assistant, uh, Kevin, uh, is a master gardener and wannabe farmer and has helped us farm many things on our plots. And he really has got a taste too. So he transitions a lot of these transfers on the transports them to chefs, to farm markets, uh, to processors. So uh, he's an essential part of the team. Let me just talk about a few other food, food crops that we are have been investigating for a while, roselle, hibiscus. Uses, we're not only the, the, the calices uh, putting on, they're very tasty and colorful, but uh, our food service who works closely with us, uh, the cafeteria, university cafeteria, <laughs> we, we use uh, them to, uh, their staff to tell us how things taste as a salad dressing out of here. We, we harvest the baby roselle, one of the larger stuff, and uh, ask for their taste. And then if it's good enough, they'll uh, try it out on the students. Um, continuing with leafy greens, um, I would say uh, basil is our big one. Basil in many places has suffered from downy mildew. It's rampant over the last five years throughout the U.S., especially in the South. And it's moved into Jersey and wiped out a lot of standard Genovese basil and others. So uh, Jim bred some uh, mildew resistant, Enfusarium resistant, and chill resistant basils that are doing quite well and they're uh, branded and patented. Uh, and not only do we grow on black plastic, I just wanted to show we grow on white plastic as well. We don't always use herbicides, sometimes straw, because a lot of people like organic. Uh, that's what a terrible job that is, especially if you have itchy hay. Oh, man. So anyway, great projects to be involved with, and you learn a lot. And uh, we're still learning all the time. And we watch these crops grow. Here's one bok choy germinating. 
and during the growth of the season gets a little bigger just before harvest. And then we put out our, um, we get our growers to come and visit. This is again, the most important thing, not just bring them to a, a vendor uh, of the market, but bring them out in the field, let them smell it, let them taste it. And you can see the Chinese, the Hispanics, the Caribbean people, uh, they get a really good feel for these crops and uh, decide what to uh, purchase uh, in the growing season. As I mentioned earlier, edamame is uh, a great crop and Dr. Chen uh, was great in getting seeds from the Taiwan Seed Institute. And so we had a co-grant. <laughs> the winner of the edamame project uh, was gonna go to Mars in a greenhouse. So this was, uh, a fun project to work with and an important one it, because edamame is like, has no cholesterol, is high in sugar, tastes great. And um, it's a substitute for meat and something you can grow very quick. Rather than that, that film where the guy is growing potatoes like crazy on Mars, this is the stuff you wanna grow. It grows really fast, but there's so many different types. We use the plastic culture system trickle irrigation, six inch mound, we inoculated with rhizobium, try to keep the pH in general from six to six five, 200 pounds of five, 10, 10. The 10 is probably too much because most of our fields have too much phosphorus, but it's what a lot of people are used to. Okay, so that's, uh, you can see, it just looks like a bunch of soybeans coming up. We uh, a staggered double rows there. And, took data on all these varieties. And I was shocked to find when we grew these, some are short and stout like soybeans, some are taller and some are very viney. There'd be 10 feet long vines, which are impossible to harvest for us. So we like to grow on plastic culture or like soybean fields so on narrow rows. So we, we eliminated a lot of these high yielders because there's a tremendous amount of biomass, but it, impossible to harvest those beans easy. Uh, and we had some winners uh, that we especially like that are starred here. Uh, Green Legend actually gave some of the highest yields, but it took 120 days again. And in some places in North Jersey, that's not gonna do it. South Jersey, fine. Most other places can handle it, but 90 degree, har 90 day harvest was just a little too short. This is a long season crop. Uh, yeah, Lucky Lion, Rico. Yeah, these, these are all, they taste is really good and good for you. Uh, and then we'd ship over some to Jim Simon's lab and he can tell you all the antioxidants, minerals, vitamins. And here in this particular case, between these varieties, there was quite a difference in the amount of isoflavones. Uh, and he hydrolyzes them. It's quite a process with his methodology, but it generates a few uh, publications and help us orient the future of nutrient dense foods. A lot of our foods are not nutrient dense, especially our iceberg lettuce. And, uh, they don't have much going for them. And, and that's why Rutgers came out with the Rutgers red leaf lettuce. It actually has more antioxidants than blueberries, more than kale. It is a superfood and it tastes good. Uh, for many years, uh, Albert Iani, uh, a recently retired horticulturalist, uh, began by collecting 45 selections of various peppers that were being grown in New Jersey, small plots. Uh, it, mostly we grow green peppers <laughs> in mild tasting, standard green peppers. But we could see that there was a demand for different types. And Albert classified them as exotic types or ethnic types. Uh, I call them multicultural types. But uh, there's several markets, the fresh market and the hot sauce market. And I'll show you a couple of these. And here's the man we call Dr. Pepper. Uh, he uh, emigrated from Nigeria where they love habaneros. The hotter, the better. This guy just chomps on him and he doesn't break a sweat. Man, I just touched some of these habaneros and, and my mouth is uh, on fire and I got mucus coming out of every orifice. 
so that's Dr. Pepper. You can check out some of his work and he still collaborates with us. Uh, this was one of my slides from like 12 years ago when we first started looking at Anaheim chili cayenne. Basically, I said the heat scale is 50,000 to 500,000, I'm saying. That, that, that's been blown out of the water. Uh, habaneros now typically go for 1 million, uh, like the scorpion and the Trinidad, and up to 2 million, like the ghost pepper. It's crazy what people are looking to grow and getting good money from the hot sauce people. So uh, especially you guys down in Texas, I know you like stuff hot. You might want to think about uh, some of these new varieties, and I'm sure you're already doing some of that. Uh, but now it's catching on in the Northeast. Uh, we're moving out of that uh, Italian red hot, mild hot stuff into the, the minor leagues and the major leagues. Uh, I'm not going to show you that video. And uh, here's one of our star blends. We also sam uh, sampled people and they said, ah, most of those habaneros at 500,000 are way too hot. So uh, Albert and Jim got together and they hybridized a Mexican and an and a African. Uh, and it came out like, unlike their parents, it, it ranges from a, an orangish yellow to a straight orange and even some red ones in there and it was released and we call it pumpkin habanero because it looks like a little pumpkin uh, it's mild in heat you know only 50,000 scoville units you know compared to a cayenne might be 20,000 scoville units Italian red hot might be 10,000 scoville units this is uh, acceptable to me uh 50,000 scoville units and I think much of the general Americanized population then there's our beauty, Rutgers Rose Bell Red. It looks like a beautiful bouquet of roses. It shines Rutgers Red. And uh, this is a big selling point for us. So uh, this was recently patented by Jim and, and Albert in our breeding plots. And in these plots, uh, again, we bring the vendors down to see how things are growing before we give them uh, the material. So with our trusty band of uh, people to harvest, you can see the Rose Bell Red and the uh, Pumpkin Habanero. And Trevor, he's still out there breeding. He's Jim Simon's main breeding guy. He tags every particular plant that looks even better than the previous generations that have been bred. They've been through four, five, six generations of selective uh, breeding. And uh, so the next batch of seeds is coming soon. Uh, Utsi has been very good. He's a postdoc student. He gives us a lot of information on Indian tastes of our different varieties. He's a great worker and he's gonna be a, a good addition to our team. Uh, and then we load up these uh, produce, crates and crates of them, about 12 pounds of crate or 15 with the, some of them. And Kevin goes off to the uh, various uh, restaurants and for their feedback and farm markets and mostly the hot sauce people. And here is one of the hot sauce people that I have to deliver to and we packed it into his car. And uh, he's quite a character, Bob Ferretti. He quit Wall Street after making a lot of money and now he doesn't care about money. So <laughs> he donates all his hot sauce to the local church. They got a certified kitchen. He makes tons and tons. And every year they make about $25,000 just on their hot sauces because it's just donations. You just come in, pay whatever you want for his hot sauce. Great guy. And, and he gives us so much feedback on the process. Other people that have been getting, here's our Rutgers evaluation page uh, where we evaluate both our pumpkin habanero and our rose bell red as to fruit quality, color, skin texture, shape, size, marketability. In this case, uh, this executive chef who uh, cooks for like five different large restaurants really gave us quite a great recommendation, awesome fruit. And he cooked it in different ways that I don't even know what he's doing, but it's great. Apparently his people like it too. 
he not only did it raw in different ways, he dehydrated the pepper, added olive oil and garlic, which uh, makes everything taste better. So uh, I was impressed with both fruits. Thank you, thank you, Executive Chef Michael. Then I dropped this, another similar batch over to the president of Rowan University. It's uh, about a 20,000 person university. He's the president. <laughs> And he's been making hot sauces on the side for many years. He, he's uh, really a man of uh, high heat intensity. His company is called uh, Hushman's Hazardous Hot Sauces. So I said, oh, this is gonna be a, a bust. He's uh, not gonna like these milder ones. But lo and behold, he says, I can do something with this beautiful and tasty pepper because you can taste the heat, but it doesn't blow you away. And the same thing with the Rose Bell Raid, he thought it like 200,000 Scoville units, 300,000, that was good too. So he's working on that. And he's doing it in a nonprofit way. He sells it to all the university students and parents. And every year he's able to give a four year scholarship to somebody in the plant science field. What a great way to earn uh, money for your students. Now let's go where the rubber meets the road. So these are all my friends at a local market near me, uh, Tri-County Farm Market in Heightstown, Central Jersey. It, it's been there for 50, 75 years, it has its ups and downs, but mostly it's on and up after the pandemic. And uh, it's great because it gives you that diversity. We find a lot of Asian farmers and market people shopping here, Hispanics, and probably about 10 other ethnic groups that come and, and barter with the farmers that have the loading dock right here. They bring it fresh uh, three days a week. And uh, so I set up my own little display table uh, with these peppers and had, uh, here was a farmer that also happens to be on the State Board of Agriculture. So Angelo uh, did a write-up, it was very favorable. It's good to get experienced people. And then uh, an agricultural reporter from Farm Bureau that writes many different places and samples many different types of foods. So he got to, Richard got to put his uh, opinions down. Um, he has a few doubts about marketability because of uh, being a niche market. He's mostly a big market type of guy, but. Uh, we'll take everybody's uh, comments. Um, and I, I've been working with Albert for like, I've known Albert since he was a graduate student at Cornell, actually, when I was doing, supporting some of their research. But now uh, we work together at our Central Jersey Cream Ridge uh, Experiment Station, where I have literally a team of 25 master gardeners, and they help us plant and harvest and measure and evaluate. They uh, cook a lot of this stuff up. They give us feedback on it. They, they love to eat. So they're always coming up with some concoctions. So again, uh, thank you guys. And we do get data though. That's what's great about it. There's so many hands in this and so many good scales set up. What a great resource on that 300 acres that uh, we take the yield. We can see in these all these hot peppers here, Carolina Reaper is, got the reputation for being like super hot and everybody wants it, but it doesn't yield that much. Whereas pumpkin habanero is much uh, different. It's got a very hot yield per acre. And similarly, you can uh, evaluate how much you're gonna get from the acre. Uh, what's the plant size? Because when you're developing a crop budget, that's what we're doing now. How much is that uh, diesel fuel cost, how much did the labor cost, how much did the plastic culture cost, what is the yield, how, what is your net expenses compared to your expected income. And that's how we are working to develop crop budgets for many of these key uh, crops and hope to do more in the future. That's really important for all of us. That's why we need a bigger team to get crop budgets and profitability so that the farmer doesn't go willy-nilly and plant just anything. We're trying to improve his odds of success. And Albert, especially over that 10 year period from 210 to 219, uh, first he separated into size. These are Rosebell Red. Our key candidate is pretty large. 
whereas uh, Rutgers Pop Muhammad now is barely making the medium size one. So everybody's got their uh, opinions, great data on the number of fruit per plant, the weight of the fruit. When is it gonna mature, late, medium, early? How long is it gonna hang on the plant? Five weeks, three weeks before it rots. Once it's ripe, how long can you hold it on the plant? Because you can't always get the market. If you do have to harvest at, at uh, four degrees C, you got a cooler, that's how long it's gonna last. It's pretty good. If you got room temperature, one to three weeks, depending on the variety. The perishability and shelf life is very important. And value added. Man, these chili habaneros are just hitting the market every which way. You find them in the uh, McDonald's and the box stores. Everybody's getting into candy and oils and hot sauces. It's really spreading like wildfire. So the, the market, I think, is, is rich for the future. Uh, here's again some of our harvest. So we made our own Rutgers pumpkin habanero. We have a lot of culinary people and the food science people right next door in a big apartment and the cafeteria can sell it and, a, and the local uh, stores uh, to test. And actually we get test results from this, which is not so much, we don't have to be that profitable. We just have to get some feedback before we uh, send it out to others. Very briefly, if I have time, Joe, I just mentioned hydroponics, okay? Or I can cut it here. Okay, I'll keep going. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, I can see you shaking your head. Uh, There's only a few more minutes. Um, you may not have seen this, but Genoa knew our uh, Texas uh, horticulturalist here recently made the news, uh, the urban ag news, uh, talking about uh, ethnic Asian crops uh, indoors, indoor production. And here's a beautiful picture of her with her, uh, I'm not sure what cucurbit type that is, but uh, it's beautiful and some of the leafy greens. There's a whole article there on the website that you can check later. Congratulations, Jinchi. And maybe she can add to that later. Uh, we've been growing various herbs and it commercially, and it, this is like a, a large greenhouse, but <laughs> one thing they found, if you put on these small hydroponic systems, you can roll them all around and a customer can come right into the greenhouse and pull out uh, if they want that basil or thyme whatever's growing in there and just can quickly uh, send a nutrient solution up to the top and it trickles down the column. And here's your basic uh, reservoir. And uh, it's got a pump that operates electrically. And this guy didn't know anything three years ago, five years ago, because <laughs> his dad has a thousand acre side farm. <laughs> and I said, Randall, you're going to do a, a what? A greenhouse? What do you know about greenhouse? My wife's killing me. She's tired of me mowing the grass and our son's going to leave the farm. So they said, okay, David, you can have a greenhouse. And the kid is now turned into an expert. And we have a whole new generation of people uh, looking at hydroponics. And now there's career opportunities. We have like three mega hydroponic greenhouses. Uh, Ed Harwood retired from Cornell. <laughs> He built this in our Newark, New Jersey. These are just stacked aeroponic systems to the ceiling. And they use these uh, systems where they, they can spread right up to the top and harvest and, and manicure. Uh, huge uh, greenhouse. I mean, that 2,000 square feet, that's probably like 200 acres in the field. And they, instead of waiting 75, 85 days to harvest, they harvest in 40 to 50 days. Amazing operation. Uh, and this gives you a little close up of how that works uh, in different ways. The uh, roots dangle from that cloth. These are spray tubes that shoot a fine mist every so often in the solution chamber. And it's mostly all kinds of le leafy greens. And boy, do they, uh, you can see a list, arugula, bok choy, kale, watercress, red leaf, scent, babies, uh, leafy greens, 2 million pounds a year, just from that one two acre site. 
And uh, there's a, the Bowery, just uh, a mile away from there. There's uh, edible gardens greenhouses that also do a similar, more flat conventional greenhouse production system. But uh, in the short season areas in the Northeast, uh, this is the way to go, as well as many other areas. And this is the way we've gone uh, in the last 10 years at Rutgers. We have a couple acres of uh, semi-commercial looking greenhouses. And if you look in our main bay of hydroponics, uh, this is what it looks like while we're growing uh, stuff on a flatbed. We call this geoponic growing. That's our Rutgers red lettuce. You can see a little bit of it there. Uh, we have a nutrient film technology here, different types comparing red lettuce to bib lettuce and others. Uh, it's, it, it, this 200 gallon container uh, provides the uh, water here. It's at a slight tilt, so water's pumped there and it trickles down here and uh, fertigates the roots that are dangling in, in the moving water. And then there's your, your aeroponic type. Uh, oh man, uh, let me go back. Uh, the columns, look at the footprint on this, a, mo a more smaller scale greenhouse. And we have had several and we do a crop budget on this that uh, you, you can see the bok choy growing and uh, red lettuce. And uh, it's great to control. We never have to worry about the light changing. We can always control the photo period, the humidity, the water supply, the temperature, the pH. Uh, it has its own set of problems, but, uh, and there's the portable types of mini ones that some people are putting in their homes now, uh, hydroponic aeroponic systems. So before I get to the questions, I'm gonna try to show you a two minute video on the next slide. If you're on a cell phone, it may pixelate. If you're on an older computer, it may pixelate. Even if you're on a newer computer, it may pixelate. Don't worry, I'll just, just try to visualize as much as you can, and I'll try to narrate at the same time. And if you want a copy of it, I'll send a YouTube link to Joe and he can uh, send it on to you, okay? That's gonna be the way we're gonna do this. So here we are planting and our crew, we uh, have little transplants and then we stick them into these cups. You can see it's four-sided. Yeah, you can put like uh, 480, uh, plants just in that square foot there. And let's see. And there's the dosatron, which controls MPK. So you can put a diversity of crops in these little cubes, they rock wool cubes. We plant nasturtium, marigold, bok choy, kale, spearmint, lettuce, oregano. I never knew nasturtiums grew like this. I've eaten them before and seen the little ones, but this thing grew like eight feet tall. It was crazy and almost drowned out the marigolds. Some of the mints uh, do well in indoor production. That's a high value item. The bok choy, first in the beginning it was all yellow. We didn't have enough nitrogen and scrape for experimenting with how much fertility each of these things made. And this is after we, we worked that out. And it's a little different, difficult copy. There's our Rutgers red lettuce. Isn't that a beauty? Loaded with antioxidants. You can see the, the water trickling down the tube and hear it. I know, hopefully you can hear it. Uh, right to the ceiling, 12 feet high. And then the class harvest at the end. These are part of my classes, entrepreneurial agriculture. We get our uh, vegetable boxes, waste stuff up, harvest it. So for here, we want to, we want uh, five pounds per box. Five pounds per box. 
Do you need more time, Bill? No, nope, this is it. Several of these students have gone on to grow their, start their own farm or greenhouses as they graduated, or at least they're more educated consumers. And uh, that's it. So okay. thank you for your time. Ah, whoa, get out of there. Uh, <laughs> thank you.